Okay, here we go. Uh, good morning. My name is John Stotz. I'm the director of adult faith formation uh, here at Christ the King Catholic Church in Nashville. I know most of you, but for those of you who will be watching this later, uh, this might be our first first meeting. Um, I'm going to say a few words in introduction to what we're doing here in general uh, before focusing in on today's session and turning the rest over to uh, our speaker today, Father John Donahue. Uh, back, way back in June, uh, on the heels of the murder of George Floyd and the ensuing demonstrations and protests, uh, parishioners gathered on Zoom uh, for a number of listening sessions called Why Black Lives Matter that were designed to help us sort through what was going on in our world, what was going on in our minds, uh, to help us um, collaborate together and figure out where we were. Out of these sessions came what we've come to call Christ the King's Anti-Racism Initiative, uh, which is really just a collective of folks working on various projects meant to advance our understanding and practice of racial justice in the Catholic Church. Um, one of these sub-projects uh, was an education campaign that was meant to help us as a parish understand why the struggle against racism is not only a matter of justice, but also Catholic identity and faith. Um, and in organizing this campaign, which we're seeing unfold, we thought it would be useful to start with two foundational sessions, one rooting anti-racism in our Eucharistic theology, and that we did last week with Father Steve Wolf from the Diocese of Nashville, and another to root anti-racism uh, and social justice in the Christian scriptures, giving us two firm anchor points, um, which will be the focus of our current session. Uh, after this, we're going to begin zooming in, so to speak, on local issues uh, armed with this foundational understanding. Uh, over the next two weeks, we'll have Monsignor Owen Campion of the Diocese of Nashville offering two sessions that look at the history of this diocese in light of racial justice. The first focusing on the efforts of Catherine Drexel and Bishop Byrne, and the second looking at desegregation and civil rights under Bishop Durick. Um, I had the opportunity to speak with, with Monsignor Campion uh, his knowledge of this stuff is exhaustive and very interesting. So if you're a student of history uh, or not, tune in the next two weeks for that. After that, on a Thursday night, we'll have Linda Wynn from the Tennessee Historical Commission talking about uh, the construction of I-40 and its effect on North Nashville as an example of structural racism in our time. Um, the series is being recorded, will be available on our website for you to share uh, with friends and families. Um, if you'd prefer that I remove your identifying information uh, from the video, shoot me an email. It shouldn't be too hard to do that, but know that you will be, um, your face will be up if you share it, and I'm happy to remove that if necessary. Okay, so today's speaker, I'm very excited to introduce him, um, though we've just met. Uh, he is a renowned scholar of the Christian scriptures, uh, and I accidentally read one of his monographs from the 70s, preparing for something completely different, and love to see those worlds collide. Uh, Father John Donahue uh, is a Jesuit. He's a native of Baltimore. Um, he entered the Jesuits in 51 and was ordained in 64, some couple of years ago. I uh, studied philosophy and classics and then went on to get a PhD in New Testament from the University of Chicago. Uh, and he wrote his thesis on the Gospel of Mark. Uh, he taught scripture here in Nashville at Vanderbilt Divinity uh, from 73 till 80 um, and reports having fond memories of Nashville. Uh, and of course he does. Uh, he then taught for a while at uh, the Jesuit School of Theology at Berkeley, uh, where I believe he taught or at least met uh, our own Father Bruce Morrill, um, who we're affiliated with here at uh, Christ the King. And then from 2001 to 2005, he taught at St. Mary's Seminary and University, where he is the Raymond D. Brown Distinguished Professor of New Testament Studies Emeritus. He is a past president of the Catholic Biblical Association of America, um, he was consultant to the U.S. bishops when they wrote Economic Justice for All in 1986 uh, and has written extensively on issues of social justice. Uh, most recently in 2014, uh, Seek Justice That You May Live, Reflections and Resources on the Bible and Social Justice. In the chat window, I'm going to throw up a link to two documents that may help us going forward. Uh, one, an outline of his talk, the other, a collection of scriptural passages on justice. I'll be putting these up on the screen via PowerPoint as well during his talk, so you can use those as a resource. Uh, so without further ado, uh, Father Donahue, I welcome you, um, and we're excited to learn from you this morning. Uh, can you hear me now? 
Uh, okay. Uh, well, thank you. Uh, it's wonderful to have this opportunity to talk to a group of people concerned about social justice. Much of my life has spent, been spent talking about this, raising issues, not only here in the United States, but I taught in Africa and I taught in the Philippines. And what I've found is that no matter how much we know about social justice from the church teaching that has been strong in the last century, mainly in encyclical statements by church leaders, it is the Bible that will touch people's lives. That as they engage certain of the scriptures, prayerfully think about these scriptures it can change their lives, and in changing their lives, perhaps help to change the world around them. So thanks for inviting me, and I look forward to our discussion this morning. No question is out of order. I used to tell my students, there is no such thing in my class as a wrong question. There may be wrong answers, however. Okay, John, shall we go ahead? Yes. Uh, do you want me to go ahead and start this uh, slideshow? Yeah. All right. Here we go. Can you hear me now? Yes. Not okay. Here. This is a wonderful uh, PowerPoint that John put together. What I, I've done is, or what the PowerPoint does, is to talk, can John, can I move the PowerPoint myself up and down? Uh, no, that's my responsibility, unfortunately. Okay, we'll go to the next slide. Yeah. Uh, social justice, well, the previous slide is, I think in Francis, we have a Pope, who speaks in a way that touches people's lives, in a way that really integrates the scripture and challenges our world today. Social justice itself is a process, not an outcome. It seeks for a fair redistribution of resources, opportunities and responsibility, challenges the roots of oppression and justice, empowers all people to exercise self-determination and realize their full potential, builds upon social solidarity and community capacity for collaborative action. Now that's a definition by the School of Welfare of the University of California, not explicitly religiously concerned, but I think it really does describe the kind of quest for social justice that we find reflecting it in the Bible and in the teaching of Pope Francis. Okay, can we go to the next slide? Uh, John, you, you decide when people should come in. Uh, uh, I just wanna say a few words though. Uh, the Bible doesn't offer revealed morality, that is what to do, but revealed reality the kinds of persons we are to become if we are to hear its message faithfully. It speaks more to the conversion of individuals and groups, not to specific programs. Next slide, John, please. Uh, you can skip this. Okay, here, uh, previous slide. Fundamental biblical perspectives. There are four things I want to highlight. God is interested in this world here and now. This sounds obvious, but so often so much of the church teaching has been eschatological. That is, we are here to live a life worthy of final loving contact with God and our world will end. That created an idea that the concern for the world is not equal to other religious concerns we have. And that has changed very much. Where this appears most interestingly is in the biblical text that I will talk about. The fundamental proclamation of Jesus 
is the arrival of God's reign or God's kingdom. That is a term that really it could be explained as Jesus' vision of God's presence in the world manifest in his life and teaching. That's a summary of the word for kingdom. Critical to the Bible is concern for the poor and the marginal, as well as for the danger of wealth that is pervasive in the Bible throughout the New Testament and the Old Testament. And finally, which may link up most uh, coherently with what your group has been discussing. The Bible challenges us to break through the religious and social barriers of our time. And we will see this especially in the parable of the Good Samaritan, which John will uh, show to us later. So let's go to the first point. And I have here, you can read this rather quickly. It may help you. Maybe you have a few questions on this point. John, can you handle questions? Happily. Any questions on this point or anything come to mind, anybody? Is this relevant for you or anyone you know at this time? John? Go ahead. Last night we heard a very good sermon by Father Fon at the drive-in mass in the parking lot. And he said that the coin of tribute had Caesar's picture on it. And that the idea was that you give to Caesar what is Caesar's and you give to God what is God's. I always thought that meant about contributing money to the church on the weekend. <laughs> but Father Fon pointed out that we are made in God's image and on the coin is our image and we belong to God. And I thought, oh my gosh, I've never thought of that. Anybody else have a reaction to that? That's today's gospel. Uh, can I ask a question uh, that's not today's gospel, but relates to what we're looking at? Uh, uh, Richard Rohr, the Franciscan, in his book, The Universal Christ, goes back to Genesis and says that Christ entered all of creation. He calls it the first incarnation and this all the way through to 13 billion years, through whatever, whatever was in existence. Father Donahue, do you uh, relate to that or do you believe that or? Well, all creation, all creation for the first moment of uh, anything existing in the universe that isn't God is really a blessing by God. And so God never doesn't sort of uh, say, I'll create it, they're on your own. God is sustaining present in creation. Uh, and that's why in the rhythmic beginning of Genesis, it always says, and it was good, it was good, it was good. All the elements of creation, the light, the, the earth, the stars, the universe, and then it ends with uh, sort of the creation of Genesis 1, 7. God created humanity in his image. In the image of God, he created them. Now, this creation presence of God is fulfilled in the incarnation of God's very word of creation in the presence of Jesus Christ. So there is a sense that there is a deep presence of Christ in everything that's been created. Uh, they, they refer to that as deep Christology. Um, and that's all I can say at this point without uh, 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 a lot of further reflection on uh, the mystery of the incarnation. But all creation, everything that is good, it was good, good, good. God remained, uh, the beginning of the world was it to be good. The goodness flows from God 
The goodness is in creation, is found in creation, but the epitome of God's self-revelation is Christ Jesus. Thank you. By the way, the previous thing about render to God what is God and to humans what is human. The, the, Pope Francis has a wonderful meditation on this in the Vatican website this morning. And he says, the primary thing is everything belongs to God. So you render to God what is God. But that does not mean that other institutions can manifest the presence of God. So we remain, we render to them in uh, being infused with God's wisdom and God's presence. They are still part of the way they have a claim on our lives. John? Yes? No, I meant John Stott. <laughs> Sorry, it's not Father John. Uh, hi. Um, I'm been thinking about in this moment where we are, you know, beginning to wake up to climate change, um, the, the idea that, you know, God's word brought forth creation. And so that has, and then in Jesus, we had um, the, the incarnation, but that we, I, I think, and many have separated that from creation. And so now we're challenged to keep everything together, that it's all one. I think that's well stated. Uh, we have a, a question in the chat, um, simple question. Uh, Steve Meyer wonders where evil comes from. You know, that, that's a theological question, utterly important, that would take a two or three hours to discuss. I mean, evil comes from the human evil comes from human decisions, and uh, which create uh, a whole kind of complex of evil events. I don't want to talk today to address that. Uh, because it's a theological issue that I think uh, is with us. I'd rather talk about today, and I thought the talk was more about issues of confronting the evil we already have in social injustice and racial prejudice, rather than solving the, uh, the problem of the origin of evil. Uh, I don't... John, could we move to the next slide? This is Pope Francis that addresses some of the uh, issues uh, we talked about. Uh, plus, the, uh, I would ask all those who have positions of responsibility in economic, political, and social life, and all men and women of goodwill, let us be protectors of creation, protectors of God's plan inscribed in nature's protectors of one another and the environment. That is countering what could be evil. Uh, John, could we go to the next slide? You can just read this a bit. The next slide. Okay, um, I've done Zoom before. Can I press on something to see all the participants? Uh, 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 no, I better not play with it. Okay. Uh, my 13 year old grandniece should be here. She would help me to solve it, all the yeah. problems. Uh, the fundamental proclamation of Jesus is the arrival of God's reign or kingdom. And that's again, God's presence in the world manifest in the life and teaching of Jesus. And I said, Jesus calls to disciples to be with him and to be share his mission. That call, which took place in history, takes place at the moment of baptism in our lives. Baptism is the call 
not simply to be a member of a church, but to be a disciple. Jesus prays that my kingdom come, thy will be done on earth and in heaven, uh, as it is in heaven. That is, uh, as it is in heaven means as God wills it. Here's the important thing. Jesus announces and symbolizes the presence of the kingdom by mighty works, which tough, touch on the suffering of people in the here and now. When Jesus, for example, calls the poor blessed, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven, he's not saying the poor are happy because they get to heaven. I remember once when I was a, a young teacher, somebody came in to talk to me, a young man who was phenomenally wealthy. He came from another country where extravagant wealth was present. He was so wealthy, he would call a cab to take him from the dormitory to the bar, which was about four blocks away. And I said to him once, uh, don't you worry about this? Don't you feel that uh, you have some responsibility for the suffering people? He said, oh yeah, Father, they'll be better off than I will be in heaven. And I said, well, that's a true statement. I have no doubt about that if you get there. But the point is that when Jesus praises the poor, he is saying the reign of God is for your sake. Yours is the kingdom of heaven, should be paraphrased. On your side, in your is the reign and power of God. Uh, let's look at another slide and see what comes up. Uh, and this is, a, again, Pope Francis' idea of disciples to be with them, to set out with them, to walk through the city at different pace. He teaches them to notice what they had previously overlooked. The kingdom of heaven means finding in Jesus a God who is involved with the lives of his people. He involves others not to be afraid to make of our history a history of salvation. They both John Paul II and Francis have called the church a community of disciples. And that call that went out centuries ago is the call that should inform our lives today. Any comments? I have one question, Father. Um, so some folks have interpreted this tradition of Jesus being for the poor and saying, yes, it's incumbent on Christian believers to help the poor, uh, but in an individual way. That is, we ought to practice what we tend to call charity. I ought to give money to the poor, um, but that Jesus is not supporting any kind of collaborative political or social effort to aid the poor. Uh, What's your response to that kind of that kind of argument? Well, that's a that's a question that has arisen. First of all, there's nothing wrong. In fact, it's beautiful to be concerned for the poor. But Jesus also, in his teaching, in his more critical teaching, he attacked those very structures that, uh, in our world, we would say, uh, sort of uh, produce. Uh, uh, social sin and evil structures that uh, affect the poor and that individuals have no ability to change. For example, he criticizes the uh, uh, Pharisees at times, uh, or the lead, especially the uh, leading officials of uh, the Jewish religion at that time, the temple priesthood. He criticizes them for devouring the houses of widows. Uh, that is, they will need a structural change. They will have to change their lifestyle and their values. Uh, also, then the the whole idea that the community, the human community, is social, and we live in social structures. And uh, recent uh, literature has talked about social sin, sinful social structures. So we have to commit ourselves, just as Jesus attacked 
sinful characters of his time, most dramatically, the phenomenal gap between rich and poor. That's what the parable of the rich man and uh, Dives and Lazarus is all about. Uh, other structures that he uh, challenged. So I think we have to be involved in both individual good works and ways to create counter structures to the structures that produce a massive gap between well, rich and poor, massive uh, lack of concern for the poor, especially today, the suffering people. We have one of the highest records of child poverty in the developed world. That's a structural issue. Giving to a family that needs uh, money to support their children is wonderful. But we also have to address the structural issues that are the result of misguided human values. So that would be a kind of uh, maybe too quick answer to that important question. Thank you, Father. Uh, any other questions or comments at this point? How about the next slide then? Well, this is, is concern for the poor and the marginal, as well as this, uh, the danger of riches is pervasive in the Bible, especially in the prophetic text, that uh, the, the concern is always uh, for the most marginalized in society. And it goes through the Torah, that is the law of Israel, through the prophetic teaching, through the wisdom teaching. Uh, John, if you can go down to the text that I uh, submitted also and look at the text from Amos, for example. I think I have a couple of them attached below. Here it is, there's Amos. If you would offer me Holocaust, that's uh, worship, sacrifice, that but let justice, mishpat, surge like water, and goodness roll down like an unfailing stream. Let justice roll down like waters, the righteousness like an unflowering stream. Those two words together, the Hebrew words, mishpat and tzedakah, they're translated as justice and righteousness. But when they're in a parallel uh, phraseology, where one is joined to the other in the Hebrew Bible, uh, a good paraphrase today would be social justice. The righteousness of individuals, the goodness that creates uh, the possibility of human life uh, in the world. Uh, maybe, John, look at a couple of those other texts. This is a beautiful text. You have been told, O oh man, or human person, what is good? What does the Lord require of you? Not to all the precepts of the laws that you do right, mishpat, uh, or justice. You love goodness, hezeth. That hezeth is a sort of compassionate care for others and walk humbly before your God. Uh, you can go back to the previous uh, um, not text, go back to the, uh, yeah, this is it. Uh, I just think, and also in the New Testament, I mean, uh, Jesus is strong uh, against the danger of wealth, which I think is a major, major problem in our society today. The canonization, and for, by canonization, I mean somehow what has been called before the gospel wealth. The wealth is a sign of God's presence, but wealth is not that. The constant refrain in the parable of the last judgment at the end of Matthew is, when did we know you? When did we see you? As often as you did to the least of my brothers and sisters, you did to me. Wealth is wrong when it becomes a source of dominance over others and destroys community. 
and Paul, economic difference destroys community. One of the most telling aspects of this is Paul's beautiful tradition of the Lord's Supper. He said, when the people gather for the supper, in those days, the recollection of the Last Supper took place as part of an ordinary meal. People brought food to share at the meal. And the rich people would bring very good food. The poor people, maybe who arrived late, would just come with some bread or some uh, fruit. And the rich people said, we're getting tired of waiting for them to come. Let's eat. And Paul says, you have turned the celebration of the Lord's Supper into a way of boasting about your wealth. And you show contempt and humiliate the have-nots. And he has a horrible, a frightening statement. This is not the Lord's Supper that you eat. I think too often we forget that celebration of the Eucharist is not a celebration of our stature before God, but of our need to uh, be concerned about the suffering and poor in our midst. And, uh, and I think that that is very important. Um, any ideas on that? I mean, I, I just think we still have this residue of uh, what was called at the beginning of this century and is pervasive now, the gospel of wealth. You can see it on some of the uh, uh, evangel ultra evangelical uh, TV programs. Uh, and uh, I just think we have to counter that, especially in the kind of society we live in today. Any comments, questions? Uh, I have one question from the chat. Um, one of our participants asks, how do individuals address structural or institutional issues that are counter to the Bible's teaching? There are many ways you can do that. One obvious way, especially at this time of the year, is participating as a citizen in the process of voting. And to vote with an informed conscience. That is a conscience that is informed by the teaching of the church, by the Bible, by uh, your own experience of Christ in the world, and to let that inform your vote. A second way would be cooperation with others in raising social issues, different kinds of community participation. There are many, many of these. Bread for the world, uh, different kinds of uh, concern for social justice, being part of a group that is, is concerned. Before the pandemic began, I gave some talks to a group called Catholic Relief Services, all run by lay people. They exist all over the world. They have tremendous power and influence because they work as a group. Not everybody can be a member of Catholic Relief Services or these other organizations. But I think to participate and support uh, in, in organizations that confront poverty, evil, injustice is very important. No one person could do it alone, but many people together can move mountains. That would be my question. And I've seen so many examples of this in my life. Let me want, give you one very moving story. Uh, I taught at Loyola University right after I retired from the seminary. And I met a wonderful young couple there, uh, Kate Ryan and her husband Gabe. They married, they joined Catholic Relief Services. They have two little children. The oldest little girl is named Maya, after Maya Angelou. She's three. The newborn baby is Claire, uh, or is Dorothy rather, named after Dorothy Day. They are now missionaries in Niger, 
the poorest country in the world with these two infants. The husband is uh, the director of grants to help international groups find money for, uh, to support the people of Niger. I mean, they are individuals with deep commitments. They have committed themselves to be part of a larger group. All of us can't do that. Very few of us can, but we can support larger groups. And one larger group, of course, is the wonderful works that are done by the local diocese. Uh, religion is not a personal enterprise. Uh, that's a long-winded answer. <laughs> Uh, oh, well, John. Um, uh, yeah, I, I, I'd like to build on what you just ended with. It seems to me that the distortion that Paul is talking about in terms of the wealth and the poor of the Eucharist, um, in the in the Catholic experience, I, I think our distortion is more that the Eucharist, particularly the the, 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 the liturgy of, of, of the sacrifice section is, is a Jesus and me uh, notion. And, and it's, and it's it, that somehow when we get to that part and we go up for communion, you know, it's, 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 we, we've, we've got the sense of it's Jesus and me. It's, it's, it's this whole, uh, rather than a sense of community. And I, that would be my sense of the distortion of the Eucharist in, in terms of Paul. Do you have any comment on that? Well, yeah. I mean, first of all, when we see the Eucharist, we receive it as a group normally, except maybe during the pandemic. That is, we go to a liturgy, which is a combination of the liturgy of the word, the presentation of the scriptures, and the recollection of Jesus offering at the Last Supper, which was his life given for others. Uh, so I think uh, the, the reception of communion is an affirmation that the living Christ, the Christ who conquered fear and death and power, is at work in our lives, but in the lives of the people we're with. And I think we have to recapture much more the social dimension of what happens at our Eucharist. Uh, I mean, that's why some of the little aspects are very important. The bringing of gifts, uh, that's a liturgy, that's a part of the liturgy that suggests that has its roots in the fact that gifts were brought at the Eucharist uh, that would help people. The wine and water are not simply, or the wine and bread of the elements that will be consecrated but of those things that are necessary for food. I taught in Africa. I never forget one of the most moving liturgies went on and on and on was the offertory procession. It went on for 45 minutes. Why? Because people were bringing up and putting in front of the altar food, clothing, things that were needed in the community in which they lived. They had a sense that the liturgy was an affirmation of solidarity and sharing gifts with others. So I, I think that's important. And ways we can uh, emphasize that in our liturgy are, I think, very important. One of the most moving religious services I went to in Nashville was at a very poor African-American church where they were bringing gifts up that would be given to the poorer members of their community. And I think the more we can do this by ritual, uh, the better. That would be a kind of uh, what I say, we need an individual and social realization of what it means to take the living body of Christ into our heart. We receive the body of Christ as we have reverence for the body of Christ that is the suffering body of Christ. That's what I, what I would say at this point. Okay. Yeah, I I have a um, a thought that has troubled me for a long time. Um, the Catholic Church or the Catholics 
in earlier generations in this country were the poor. They were the immigrants. They were the outcast. And today, really, as a whole, the Catholic Church is very wealthy. And um, people in, who are Catholic are in many positions of power in our country. And some of us in Christ the King um, struggle with the fact that as a parish, we are very wealthy. And how can we better serve, better be engaged with the, the great poverty in Nashville? And I, I think that many Catholics don't remember our history and don't remember that we were the immigrants who were scorned and we were the people who needed the food that you know others donated and that's just a comment um i agree uh, and uh you know I, I just think i also know there's so much goodwill in nashville at least it was when i was there 40 years ago or i know it's grown uh, from talking to Jim O'Hara and times I get back there. I wish I wasn't so old, I'd be able to stop back there more often because I have lovely friends there who have done wonderful things. Um, but I think uh, it's a kind of change of mentality. And you're right. I, I used to joke that sort of, uh, you know, I come from an immigrant family, not, not immediately, but I mean, uh, 19th century Irish. They came as poor. My great great grandfather ran a uh, hostel for poor immigrants in downtown Baltimore. <laughs> but so many of our relatives, as they moved up the uh, social ladder, have forgotten from where they came. And I think they're also forgetting where they should be. They came from the poor and suffering. They were helped by others uh, in the church. Uh, and other great people like these one incredible orders of nuns that taught children and gave them the uh, ability to move up the social ladder, the colleges that were founded. And I think they, as the sense of realization that they did not do it on their own, they no, owe an obligation to their own history and to the present lives of the poor in the world. That's all I would say. I mean, I used to joke, you know, a lot of my relatives uh, moved from being poor Irish to rich Republicans, you know. <laughs> so, uh, okay. I want to make sure I have time to talk about the parable of the Good Samaritan. If I could put in one plug, Father, only because this intersects nicely with what we'll be doing later. Um, uh, a scholar named Robert P. Jones recently wrote a book called White Too Long, uh, subtitle, The Legacy of White Supremacy in American Christianity. Uh, Vanderbilt recently did a, a webinar on this, and we'll be reading it for our anti-racism book club uh, sometime in 2021. But, you know, he, he shows exhaustively that white Christians, including Catholics, um, sort of ascended to the middle class via benefiting from things that um, people of color could not, whether it was the GI Bill after World War II, the ability to secure an FHA loan that was denied um, to, to Black Americans, et cetera. Um, so hopefully we can continue to follow this trail uh, that Joss is bringing up and sort of evaluating where we are as a parish, um, as white Catholics, uh, most of us here in this room today, um, and you know, examining what it means that we have forgotten uh, what it meant to be Catholic and not white in this country. Uh, if, if understanding whiteness means some kind of middle or upper class uh, solidarity as well. Um, that's beautifully put. Uh, right now, I live in a retirement home, uh, a Jesuit retirement home. And most of the staff, nursing staff, service staff are African-Americans. It gave me an opportunity to learn about their lives and the beauty of their lives in a way I never had before. Even my life as a priest living a fairly prosperous life, I never understood the kind of sufferings these people. So, so there's a kind of sense that uh, 
we need a basic empathy. We also have to be learners. Uh, let's go to the parable of Good Samaritan. And I think that will answer some of these questions because it's really critical today. Okay. Uh, the parable is so familiar, I think we can uh, uh, not always understand the wealth of it, the riches of it. Uh, it begins by somebody, the lawyer, like all lawyers, he wants a clear answer. I don't want to... Uh, <coughs> criticize lawyers. I have lots of relatives that are lawyers. But he he sort of said, what's it mean to love your neighbor? Or Jesus says, the commandment, the greatest commandment of the law is to love God with your whole heart, mind, and soul, and your neighbors yourself. Then the lawyer says, who is my neighbor? Then you have this story. A man fell victim to robbers. He's going down from Jerusalem to Jericho. That's... If, Okay, well, I don't know. I just got a sign said my battery's running low. You want to plug in your CV. That's not true. My, I'm hooked up to a power thing. Okay, but uh, the man uh, is robbed. It's a very dangerous part. It's from a high point. Jerusalem is the highest, one of the highest points in Israel. Jericho is near the Dead Sea. Okay, so he falls among robbers. They strip him, they beat him, they leave him half dead. That's very important. All the identifying characteristics of who this man could be are taken away. We don't know whether he's Jew or Greek, whether he's Samaritan or people of Judean. We don't know even whether he's alive or dead. It's just a human person created in the image of God who is before us. So a priest goes down that road and uh, he saw him and he passed by on the other side. I'm going to be a little pedantic now because the, the Greek there is so beautiful. Kaiadon parelthen. Seeing him, he walked past on the other side. Likewise, a Levite, another religious official, came to his place. When he saw him, he passed by on the other side. Kaiadon parelthen. But a Samaritan traveler who came upon him was moved with compassion at the sight. That is an incredibly shocking verse to, uh, that's an incredibly shocking verse to uh, the uh, culture of that day. The hatred between Jew and Samaritan was radical. It was two religious groups fighting to be the authentic interpreters of a tradition. It's like the difference between Shiite and Sunni in the Arab world today. And we see the kind of slaughter that brings about. But the key word, he was moved with compassion. He sees, but the bridge between passing by and stopping to help is the word compassion. The word compassion in both Hebrew and Greek is a word that suggests deep feeling. In fact, the Hebrew word uh, from which we translate compassion is achamin, which is the same, it derives from the word for womb. So compassion is like that feeling a woman has at the first stirring of new life in her. And compassion is the bridge between mere seeing and entering into the wound uh, the life of another with healing and concern. This is very important. We are ceasing to be a compassionate society. And I think that's one of the horrors of what's going on today. We have turned poor people into rioters. Even we have turned people from other country into a threat to our national identity. So what's he do? He doesn't pass by. He approaches the victim. He pours on oil and wine and bandages the wounds. There's a subtle irony there because the Samaritan and Levite who were going from Jerusalem to Jericho, they would have been offering daily sacrifices like our daily liturgy, sacrifices of oil and wine. And so he is offering the true sacrifice. Uh, then he lifts him up, see the personal contact. 
places him on his own animal. He takes him to an innkeeper and he says, take care of him. If you spend more than what I have given you, I shall repay you on the way back. This is important because he not only enters the world of the suffering people with compassionate help, but he treats him in such a way that he will not become the slave of the innkeeper. In that culture, if you didn't pay, if he didn't pay, once the innkeeper says, well, you're doing well, I took good care of you, uh, where's the, my money for it? Oh, I don't have any money, they robbed me. Well, you have to stay here and work three months more helping with my inn, so helping to take care of things to pay you back. No, when the, inn, when the Samaritan says, uh, I will repay you on my way back, He's saying, I will care for our only for suffering, but I will allow him to become a free person. Okay. So then the parable ends with, which of these three, in your opinion, was neighbor? And he answers, the one who treated him with mercy. Now, mercy in the Bible is not sort of forgiveness simply. It is not forsaking violence. Oh, the person, the judge showed mercy. That is, he didn't punish him the way he deserved. Mercy in the Bible is saving help. It is entering the world of another with saving help. When we say at liturgy, Lord have mercy, Christ have mercy, Lord have mercy, we're not simply answering, asking forgiveness. We're asking for God to enter our world as helper, sustainer, and compassionate lover. And then Jesus says to him, go and do likewise. What is it to be a neighbor? It is to do likewise. It is to enter the world of the victim, to see that world, to see it with compassion, to bring real material help. But there is a more shocking element of this. And I'll come back to the... Uh, point I mentioned in the beginning, which is very important for us today. It was a Samaritan who stopped. Now, in the Gospel of Luke, there's another Samaritan story, another story where the outsider manifests the true will of God, and that's in the story of the ten lepers. It's the Samaritan store, leper who comes back and offers thanks and gives glory to God. So in the Gospel of Luke, a Samaritan is a model of love of neighbor. And also the Samaritan is a model of giving glory to God, of fulfilling the, the task of constant thanksgiving to God. So what I want to say is, it is the Samaritans in our world today who perhaps are the ones that are teaching us the deepest meaning of the teaching of Christ. The Samaritan may well be the outsider that we don't want in our world. The outsider that we think is a rioter or is causing problems uh, of violence in our city. The Samaritan is the one that at times is bringing, teaching us how to truly worship God. That's why I was happy to hear some of the books you're reading, but, or that Vanderbilt is reading. But I would recommend also uh, uh, two books by Isabel Wickerson, the uh, book on caste and also Under a Thousand Sons, where she is talking about black immigration. And, uh, I have found also that uh, as I get to know the African American people that I live with and that care for me and others, their values are values that we are losing or have lost. Values of uh, compassion, values of social care for another. I'll just stop here. I don't know how much more time we have. John, you take over and uh, I wish I had time to uh, have many more questions. Or questions, ask questions, reactions. Uh, 
If you can find my email address, John can send that to you. I can send you uh, literature suggestions of anybody who wants to continue follow up. But I'd like to hear some more reactions to the parable of the Good Samaritan. Where are the Good Samaritans today? Where are the Samaritans that act with love and compassion? Where are the outsiders that teaches us what it means true to love God and neighbor? Anybody? <laughs> we got a few minutes, don't we, John? Plenty of time. It may just take a minute to let people shine us. Uh, okay, just put up the parable again and let people think of it a bit more. John, it's Mary Jo. Hey, Mary Jo. I, I think um, one of the questions, it's, it's not a blanket, but I think many of the Good Samaritans are people who are in the nonprofit world. I'm not saying excluding others, but the, many of the people who I know who are in the nonprofit um, sector um, are operating out of mission. They um, oftentimes do not have much funding, are really doing um, most important work um, and being attentive to the needs of those whom they are serving. Uh, so uh, that's one group that I would classify as the Good Samaritans. I would too. Another wonderful Another book one. I remember is want to mention is Brian Stevenson, Just Mercies. I mean, he, he was a young lawyer, began to work with poor people in the South, founded an organization that has been marvelous, founded it 34 years ago. He was Harvard graduate. Uh, African-American, but it showed how it was another parable I love uh, of Jesus is this, the whole parables of the sower. The seed grows. We don't know how. It grows and becomes a wonderful tree. Uh, and that's what a lot of these little groups are. Uh, and, you know, I just am very optimistic to see how that happens. Thank you for your comment, Mary Jo. Hey, Father. Um, my name is Victor. Um, I'm a member of a 12-step program, and it is amazing um, all walks of life, people that would not mix um, that you have in the groups, and seeing people at their worst state in their lives, likely, and as they change. But the gifts that you have to share, the encouragement, um, the faith, and things like that, um, nobody's status is is important in those rooms and the things we can learn from each other and we do learn from each other um is also independent of any of that and it, it's kind of an equalizer there um and uh there's a lot of pride involved in recovery and things like that so i think that's a beautiful place where we get to experience some of that i couldn't agree more i mean my experience of dealing with people. I remember once uh, at a Jesuit meeting, somebody stood up at the prayer of faithful and said, let us pray in gratitude for the alcoholics in our midst, because people's lives were turned around. And uh, so I think, but I think it's a model for how other groups can function. Maybe we need a sort of rich people's anonymous. <laughs> I'm serious. People get together and say, I'm not too sure that really I'm doing God's will right now. We, I mean, groups of people, I have a lot of confidence in, in, in groups of people. I use, a, use the phrase a lot when I preached, uh, the extraordinary goodness of ordinary people. And I know that's the, the people who are here today, but I think also we learn about this extraordinary goodness with others. And AA is a good example of that. Thank you. Um, I just have a quick question. Um, in these states where uh, where people are essential workers and then like, I heard some stories where they were forced to go back to, they had to choose between going back to work or getting sick. 
but if they got sick at their workplace, the state, their, their state took away their remedy to get, to get, um, to seek help if they got the COVID and, um, didn't know like how, what we're doing if the moral, if we're really just violating our moral, really just taking a hatchet to the, to the, to what we're talking about with this during the time we're in now. I didn't know what your thoughts about the time we're in now, if it's revealing how lost we all, if we are, or what your opinion was on all these things that are happening. All I can say is they are manifestation of massive injustice in our world. And that has to be countered. I mean, people are losing homes because they can't pay off their mortgage. Uh, Donald Trump Jr. owns 200 uh, poor homes in Baltimore. What will happen to them? But I mean, uh, so I think that not only in this critical time, but forever, we have to find ways as individuals, we can confront some of these unjust practices and unjust structures. So, that's all I can say. And, but I'm also grateful for your sensitivity. Jim O'Hara? No, I was thinking, John, when you were speaking earlier about uh, you know, recognizing the Samaritan in our, in our community and how well we do it. And, and I think especially at this time in our juncture, um, we, we don't. We, 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 we still uh, see the other as the other. And, and, and all of us need very hard to, you know, you were speaking about how, as you have been taken care of and you have learned about your caretakers. And I think all of us uh, have a responsibility to, to seek out the other and understand the other. And I think frankly, in an incredible, our community, Christ the King, which is, you know, has been described to you as you remember from the time you were here, is a relatively affluent and well-to-do community. And how often do we leave the comfort of our lives and seek the other and begin to understand the other? Jim, I couldn't agree more. It's a very powerful statement. And, uh, you know, I know you, your family, your history have done that. But I, I think, let me put it this way. I think an important point in our conversion is to see the outsider not as a problem, but a resource. To learn from them. The immigrant the African-American, they have much to teach us about the true meaning of life, about the true meaning of Christianity. And I think I think we might have lost Father Donahue. Can anyone affirm that you can't hear him? Yeah, I think he froze. His battery may have run out. <laughs> Can't hear him. He's frozen. He had a warning. He should have should have heard that. Um, but I think he ended on a very powerful statement. Indeed. Good last words. Yeah. Uh, we'll we'll let this be uh, a hard stop for those of you who are eyeing the time uh, because our hour is up, and hopefully Father Don he will come back for a few minutes so that we can thank him. Um, but know that the uh, the texts that we use today are on the website along with the PowerPoint slides. Um, and you can review that. I will get the uh, video of this up on YouTube and share the link on our website uh, for you to view again um, and to share with uh, friends and family or anyone else you please. Uh, any final comments uh, before we um, yeah, wait? There was, yeah, there was something that um, jumped out at me because I, I hadn't heard this before. When Father Donahue 
talked about the Samaritan um, planning to pay it for any overage expense. Um, you know, I'd always taken that as, oh, just he's a good guy, you know, and I hadn't real, I hadn't made the connection to the, you know, enslavement of the Jewish man. And that um, struck me that we, it, when being charitable, it seems that sometimes people want the gratitude of those to whom they have given or want to be praised in some way as the good person. And um, Father Donahue's point seemed to me to say that any compassion shown or any ch charity given should seek to not just heal, but to liberate the other and, you know, that person need not um, be connected with the giver again, but, but be free to move forward. Thank you for sharing, Jossie. I, I agree. I, the uh, possibility of slavery or enslavement had never entered my mind in the past readings. Um, and, you know, the sense in which Samaritan's compassion led him to pledge himself to be a surety for this man to say, you know, I will give you more money, whatever it takes to keep his freedom. Uh, you know, that's incredibly powerful. It's more than a one-off, here's some money, after that I'm done. John, I just want to let you know, John Donahue says, uh, sometimes they have power failures at his, at his house, but he thanks everyone uh, for their involvement and engagement. All right, and thank you, Jim. Uh, everybody, Jim O'Hara is the one who uh, connected us with Father Donahue. So we have him to thank for putting this together. Um, yeah. I, I just want to say this was remarkable and I would hope we could have him back again to dig he, deeper. He, he's, <laughs> he is more than happy to come to Nashville whenever he gets an invitation. Oh, well, wow. please thank him, Jim. Thank him for his session today. It was remarkable, um, and I appreciated the concept of other uh, raising that concept, and um, I, I think that's the ongoing challenge for for me, and I think for many of us. So thank you. Right. Yeah, have, I, a good, have a wonderful I, Sunday, thank, folks. Thank you, Jim, and thank you, John. Thank everybody. It's really nice to have a group like this. Thank you. Great. We'll see you all next Sunday for a Monsignor Campion. We'll learn some history um, of our very own diocese. He uh, has lots to share. So blessings this Sunday, uh, and we'll see you next time. Thanks, John. Thanks. That's great. Huh? That's great. Thank you.